Um, there's the old GX5 GSC, which is 12 stops. And we've got, um, that, that works out about eight stops under middle grey, shadow range, just over six stops above middle grey. Yeah, 18%. Loads of dynamic range to use in video. The S1, already the S1 is doing brilliant. In the sweet spot, in the ISO range, dynamic range, the S1, the yellow one, Panasonic the S1. Again, it's the current market leader, which is the A7 III, Sony. We are in the sweet spot. We climb around in the 360, 400, all the way to 1600 for um, the standard profiles, already better in performance in those settings than other cameras. Is that the leader? Not quite the same as anyone else, but certainly, certainly everywhere else. Sorry, yeah, sorry. No, no, normally. Between 400 and 800, where that drop is. Is that the same number? Well, around here, right? Yeah. Well, it's 640. It's called half size. So, we measure around how I should know that. Yeah. So, 400, 640, 800. Yeah. 1250. You can see, in all the important areas, the settings that we mainly shoot at in the day, uh, or when we're in log at night, when we get the S1 H figures through, God knows, it's going to be off the chart. It, it's quite incredible what these, the S series can do. So we all know what V-Log is. Log, yeah, now we've explained that. I don't really want to show a video. And then you put a, a, look, a look or a colour look over the top of that. Um, so designed in post You can save that, put it in, cam in your camera, in the S1 with v the V-Log update, or the S1 H. You can load up to four locks, from a, a couple of pages of banks of uh, VLT lots and call them, which you can save on DaVinci or create Photoshop, where you can lock creation uh, software and freebies out there as well. I create a lot of lots, other companies do as well, on the VLOG. I'll transform a lot of uh, carry lots over as well to VLOG to test out. And I'm really amazed by the performance of the S1. The colour science really does come alive. But anyway, without that going on for a bit, you can see that online. What is VLOG? Look it up on YouTube. So we're talking rich primary colours. There's that bottle say 18% middle greys around there. So we've got six or more stops on the S1H. Yeah, look at the very cam, yeah? We're equal to a, a 30 gram very cam camera, the very cam 35. Not equal there. We're actually bigger than the EVA one. And then minus eight stops under the shade. Need more for the shadows, just the way it is. That is how we measure under a long curve the proportion of what is being used from middle grey, yeah, all the way up to the highlights. Blacks, blacks down here, middle grey, highlights at the top. And this is how all cameras are judged. The H5 only 12 stops. That was eight and four. Eight under, middle grey, four above. And the question is on the final range. And there it is, I was talking about earlier on about on a chart, what does it look like? Because this is the 10 bit values of VLOG and the 10 bit values of log C against each other. Look how close we are. We're actually closer to C log on the array white gamma with VLOG V gamma. We are closest to them than any other camera manufacturer. What does that mean? The Array Alexa is the number one camera in Hollywood. It's the number one camera in Netflix. We've just been given Netflix accreditation for the S18 as an A camera. There's no other mirrorless camera out there which can do that. It has been given that accreditation. We can mix and match the look of the array very easily with the S18. It's insane. I've been doing it. I've made up mind about the rental company. I've been using some footage from the array and I've brought it in with uh, similar footage with the S18. And I'm totally knocked out how similar it is and it's a tenth of the price. And yeah, there's the, the, the Arrow Look Library. Uh, I've, uh, I've even looked at you in the Arrow Look Library, which you can download online. There are a couple of lots they have in the Arrow Look Library. And if you transform them with a, a, a few of the uh, free like the lock calc on, on the web, you can transform them to VLOG, and you'll see absolutely amazing how close they are. Um, I've been also doing stuff with raw photography, trying to capture all that dynamic range from 14 bit raw image and seeing how VLOG matches up, um, or how long matches up with photo. To save JPEG on the timeline, but sort of demonstrate the colour. That's great VLOG, that's how it looks when you put a particular LUT on. I'm going to show you a few LUTs, it's top right. So that's a photo from raw to JPEG, that's how VLOG LUT looks. Now we put the LUT on, like photo I've created, and it's identical to a raw image. It's so close. I'm sure you'll agree there's not much in it. Yeah? It's pretty it's pretty darn similar. Photo, 
light photo dripper light. Yeah, very, very little in it. And that's not even been highly tuned. We can tune these in a, in some of the Vinci Resolve or any colouring program. This is some Ari Lottie lighters. On SYH, one of the things you can do, NS1, if you've done the thing on update, you can actually choose Vlog as a stills uh, colour profile as well. So if you are doing behind the scenes stills photography, you can shoot your behind the scenes stills in, v in Vlog colour format so that when you come to, to grade and match, you can make it very easily grade and match your... Grade that um, between the yeah, between the, right. and between different... And that was the whole point of this exercise, yeah, to make these lights just prove yeah. that we can get that same and colour science. That, that, that behind the scenes, the behind the scenes photography, can be very easily done on the, on the same camera. Yeah, so there's a number of different looks I've created, and these are available on my midtripper.com. I've got some freebies up there from the Toronto Mount. Got a, a few guys use Vlog in any way, shape, or form. But also, do sell a few. Uh, I've, got, I've got a package for over 100 lux in what I consider to take me months to do the best luck library out there today. Even better than uh, the very camp freebies, which Panasonic do give away. 35 is it lux on there? There's, there are some nice ones, mine. There's one called um, Nicest 709. Which is uh, really nice. on the Berry Camp Lut Library. So that was, all the cinema uh, LUTs work really well with the S1H on Panasonic as well. But don't just listen to me or other LUT providers. Panasonic do give a lot of stuff away free. But I was particularly interested in, in getting that Harry look, that like, the whole purpose of designing LUTs which match the cinema look. That and raw photo. So yeah, I mean, it's just skin tone as well. I mean, in fact, sometimes they're even better than the, the video one than the, the more you can see. Massive, massive similarities. And then obviously the other thing, a lot of stuff like that online you can have a look at. Anamorphic. Now, hands up anyone who's shot anamorphic before? Anamorphic lenses? Yeah. I don't you know, man, definitely. They're really expensive. I wish Sigma did some anamorphic lenses. Is that in the pipeline? Anamorphic lenses, quality ones, I'm talking about like, like the Hawks and the the master anamorphic lenses of yesteryear, you know, some of the old cowl lenses. And, uh, I mean, there's a whole array of newer anamorphic lenses. They cost a fortune, you know. And what I tend to do, uh, even from the, uh, the, the GH series, the Mike Hawthorne series, and other cameras, you know, I've been just using projection, anamorphic projection lenses, like this is a Kawa b and times two. It's a times two squeeze, yeah? That means an anamorphic lens, it was like a, you know, a tiger's eye or a cat's eye, yeah? Um, it can squeeze using the full resolution of the sensor twice as much information into that area. So when you de squeeze, it, it's, you've got twice the width but enjoying the same focal length of the, the, this is the holding lens, or if you're using a dedicated anamorphic lens, the, the, the focal length of the anamorphic lens. So, for example, this one, I mean, here's an example of shot with this. This is the 7200 Panasonic lens, F4. I use it as a holding lens. I set it to 105, so there's no vignetting. And I've got the Bell and Howells times two anamorphic, an old lens. You can pick these up anywhere between 800 to 1500 quid. Anamorphics cost a lot of money. There are cheaper ones out there, I don't know what you're using. I was using Schneider and Cinelux. Similar to this. Yeah, similar, yeah. They, they make similar ones. Power badge, the different badge, but some of them are the same, the 16 8 whatever. Sankor, that's all I made, that's the Micro Four Thirds. There's also the Rectilux that goes on top where you can have a single focus solution. Yes, yes. There's loads of sites out there who recommend old projection lenses. And some of the glasses, particularly this one, and um, some of the stuff you've been using, it's really good. You can get the same flaring, that, light, that horizontal flaring, that blue flaring, it's got a light in it. Yeah? Like you see on the big cinematic films, and you see a car coming, and then this big blue streak as it arrives on the forecourt. That's that sort of flaring that anamorphic gives you, the horizontal flare. It gives you the oval bocker. So um, when you're on that jet, you feel you get a nice oval, the round things appear oval. And it's an aesthetic that a lot of cinematic uh, filmmakers like. Um, and I think if you use sparingly, it can work really well as you saw in that film there. You know, you can mix and match traditional lenses with the uh, more. And if you watch the rebooted Star Trek films, whenever they're on the bridge and the consoles are out of focus behind, 
you will see absolutely archetypal blue horizontal flare behind everything. Once you recognise it, as soon as you see it, you never notice it. And actually, GH5 and GH5S in particular, GH5 and GH5 they are anamorphic mode as well. Start, start to really put anamorphic into the hands of indie filmmakers, which is why suddenly Russian projector lenses went up in value enormously. And actually, you occasionally even see adverts on television now which are shot have anamorphic components to them. And that's because of things like GH5 and now S1 and S1H. It puts it into the hands of indie filmmakers. Yeah, so what we're trying to say here is that you've got these anamorphic modes, which the S18 and the GH5 and yeah. GH5S support, and there's different settings, different frame rate, and then also you've got so in camera D squeeze. So instead of seeing a squeezed image using the full size of the sensor, or in this particular setting, a 4x3 image of the sensor menu quickly, show you what we're trying to talk about. Can you see this down here? There's our log view assist, and so put LUX in the camera as well. Anamorphic D squeeze display. This supports times 2, times 1.8, times 1.5, 1.8 being the new, a lot of new anamorphic lenses. So if you shoot your 3x2, uh, 1.2 is perfect for it. 1.6, 1.5 rather, 1.33 and 1.30. So it will de squeeze, i.e., make it unsqueeze it. Let me just show you a bit of If I turn it off, the D squeeze, you'll see in the picture, there's the 4x3 squashed in anamorphic effect of the image, yeah? As soon as I kick in the D screen, we bring it back to what it should look like. This is a times two lens, power times two, bell and house, power times two, you can see underneath there. Each lens should tell you what it is. There we are, two times anamorphic. When you turn that to set it on to times two, and then when you view it, you can film and see how it's going to look in post-production. Focus on not focused on at the moment, but you can see that it's giving me the D squeeze rather than the 4x3 very much better. That means you can see in your camera what you're going to get in post-production basically. We'll still record a squeezed image, but in post-production you can either set it to CinemaScope if you're using different size multipliers like 1.8, 1.5, etc. You'll perform it accordingly, whatever size it is. And that means you can get you know, 239, 235 to 1, all the different aspect ratios of the cinema. That's what we're trying to say. So as well as working with normal spherical glass, we're working with different forms of glass. Anamorphic lenses like this, this can produce an orange flare. Yes, Carol talked about the blue fur flare for certain lenses. The Hawks do a vanilla white flare, which a lot of people like. So it's really, really nice to work with. Different and even higher lenses too. And they will work with some of these lenses you can get in EF or PL mount. Sigma produce adapters for these for the L mount. Got some cinema lenses here, I haven't got more here unfortunately. But yeah, you can hire these lenses on a daily basis. I would suggest using them sparingly, probably not like J A rounds. Uh, Roger Deakins, for example, doesn't buy yeah. anamorphic at all. Yeah. It's one of these um, yeah. anti uh, anamorphic fans. The S1H is duration free, so it's down to the amount of SD cards that you um, hot swap into the dual SD slots. The S1 has only got uh, uh, XQD and one SD card slot in this particular body. Let's show you that. It's like the bigger the XQD for photography. If you're doing raw, fast uh, recording of uh, well, raw photography, you need a high, that high burst rate needs obviously a faster card. Having said that, SD cards are coming up to nowadays up to very, very high speeds beyond V90. Very, very quick and able to write. Certainly with this camera, long duration recordings. So if you're doing events, weddings, you know, long recording sessions, you can do it quite comfortably with this camera. Don't even pull up to 30 minutes on these, 15 minutes in uh, 6K photo mode. And this will go on forever, as long as you've got the battery juice or SD card, you can keep feeding them and swapping, you know, you can just keep going. So that's the first thing which is great about this camera. The second thing is color science. I saw you earlier on about uh, there's the quick, before we get there, very few differences. So there's the S1R, top end, mainly for that uh, photographic. S1, a mixture of both photography and videography. And now with the S1H, specifically really for cinematographers, pro filmmakers, people who really want to go up a level, but it still retains the photographic capabilities, certainly of the S1, providing you really good 14-bit imagery and you can do time-lapse 
which is a very important aspect of filmmaking and photography. I know that you just bought an S1, haven't you, recently? How are you finding it? Loving it? Yeah, I mean, it's a big step up since yep. the last thing I bought ten, nine, nine years ago. So right, so it's your first camera in nearly ten years. It's not, yeah, yeah. And I always yeah, things have changed, time will change. Two, two quantum levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've had to go through a lot there, but um, you're enjoying all the benefits. And again, it's been improving further in the S1H. The fairy cam engineers have worked, top end cinematographers, engineered and worked on this sensor in the S1H. So we get the benefit, their experience, in a bigger sensor. This is bigger than the very cam 35, bigger than the very cam pure. That's only a super 35 sensor. This is a full frame sensor. We've got dual image stabilization, yeah, and uh, on lens, in body image stabilization, so I can do pans, movement, and there's no jerky, you know, like you get on other cameras. You don't actually need a gimbal for certain shots. You know, if you're all quite steady, you can, you can produce a really nice flow in motion, you know, um, without using a gimbal. Of course, people do like using gimbals if they're doing a lot of faster movement, because they're going to be able to use them. But these other functions uh, which I'm going to talk about today, which really bring this camera up as a forefront. There's the chief difference between the S1R, very graphic camera, it does do a little bit of video, it excels obviously in photographic terms. It can do 47.3 megapixels, a slightly bigger sensor, it can do a 187 high resolution photo mode. The S1 is more for low light work, so it's a 24.2 megapixel sensor. The pixel photos are actually bigger, which means more light gets into those photo buckets, which means in low light, in the dark, it performs admirably well. The S1H goes a stage further, it's a highly tuned dual ISO sensor, uh, you know, 4,000, 5,000, even 10,000 ISO is amazing, and it's better than the current full frame market, the uh, A7S II, in terms of performance in low light, in my own testings and what I've seen. And we'll look at a few graphs probably later to show the sweet spots as well. So there's a bit, so in the middle of the S1 hybrid, the S1 has clear differences, 6K cameras. This is a 6K camera now, and that means you can shoot the full open gate, the full size of the sensor. That means if, you do, if you're doing HD or 4K UHD, you can use that to crop out or do post um, production digital effects without any loss of resolution. And really engage and use that 6K facility. Or obviously, you can master your uh, films um, in 6K. Or you can extrapolate single frames, photographers, from that 6K image and get really high resolution, 18 megapixels, Carol here, yeah? Yeah. Um, in size, JPEGs, which is pretty darn good. They look as yeah. good as in my opinion, some of the raw photos. Yeah, but running at 50 frames per second or uh, 25, 30p, 24p, um, obviously Super 35 in uh, 50 frames per second, uh, 60 frames per second. We also do HD with sound at 120 frames per second now, and the dynamic range is incredible. It's noise free at those dual ISO settings which I'm going to show you. 120 in NTSC mode, 100 in PAL mode. You can switch this with the frequency range um, from 24 cinema mode, uh, 50 hertz, PAL mode, 60 hertz, NTSC mode. And that comes with a host of a four of different codecs and frame settings, which we'll show you shortly. So, loads of clear differences from the S1. And this comes already in built with feed on uh, a logarithmic curve. For uh, uh, recording all the, uh, the, the all the high uh, contrast gamma recording with 10 bit 42. And we have a ProRes raw video option for the HDMI coming very shortly with Atomos and a new firmware update. For this will be able to record up to 6K raw, 24P. I've, I've been showing 30P raw, 5.9K at IBC in Amsterdam, which is working really well in the current test. That's going to be happening soon. With the raw recording, it means it's even better than the codex recording in camera. So really high quality, and you can pull back, you know, temperature, you can pull back the highlights, and you get better detail in the shadows. The fact across all these cameras, they all share one common thing: for the best EVF 
in the market today. 5.76 megapixel. You know, I've got a huge graphical somewhere on here, uh, which is this one here. This is an HD uh, resolution only. EVF, still like EVF. It costs about two grand these cinema ones. Are. Two grand for that. This comes in as part of the camera, 5.7K, an insane resolution with a 1.78 magnification. One of you experience good? 5.7 megapixels. 5.7 megapixels. 5.7 megapixels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so megapixels. That's how we aged the 1920 temper. So if you haven't had a chance to look through, this is the S1. But the viewfinder is identical. It's past this actual H round, as we talk. Oh, hello. I'm Ed. I'm Sigma. I'm the event board member for Sigma. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Carol, for inviting me here to talk a little bit about Sigma and LNAV and the LNAV clients. Hello, Ed. Thanks for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank Terry Macassan, the full story of the um, work for an optics manufacturer, primarily involved in an optics, optic manufacturer of the wall, very important to get that um, uh, big export client. The company is working for one of the financial difficulty around about the same time the management plant disappeared, and the, the people uh, that were back in this enterprise recognised Mr. Hero's skills as a, an optics designer, might have set his own business up with their back. There's nothing like the Micro. You want to have 6K, 25 frames a second, rigged up an animal, but then to come to the SMH, and you get an idea of So there's just quite a lot of things like that. If you want to have a boot, then the FB is just cool. But then we're doing around about all of our own unique products within the same animal. The Aeroman itself, quite interesting. Four families, so not the three as it's originally before. So when you put it on the camera, it's a much more solid. Sitting. So the registration between lens and sensor is much closer and it doesn't need to go out so much. Very critical if you want to have very much It's also very wide, it's a 51.6 millimeter. Yeah, just like that. Like... That gives us a lot of opportunities to do a couple of things. We can make very fast lenses, or we can make smaller, more compact lenses. So that's the 35 mm one one tier, so it's all the advanced attitudes. So do things like this, it's the 1424 F28, so if you go for some more modest aperture. We do this for the DSLR lens. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier. And it just, the DSLR lens just comes over about there, it stands about there, it's appreciably heavier. So because we've got that 20 more frames distance, you can make these rather smaller, lighter, wide angle lenses. And at the other extreme from our 1235, we can make the Diddy. 45 and 2.8. And who wouldn't want to play that one? That'd be a good camera for 15 copy and it would work with that. If you want a 15 more wall floor, if you want one of the nicest 15 wall floors, buy the Panasonic. And that will go on our little camera, our little lens will put in a big Panasonic. I just had my camera upstairs with a wide head 90 mil with L mount on it. So it will change. And the last thing about the L mount, which is well nice, is it's highly adaptable, but it's only a 20 more fans distance. You know, you look at some of the Canon fans distance, I looked at it's 44, you don't want to it. So we've got 15 mil or so in which we can put an adapter. So now I can adapt. This is a Canon to lens, it's straight on there. We have got a cine lens in the airfield. I can use it on a Canon C300, which is 300. I can use it on my S1, on my H, I can use I can even use this on a micro SL if I want. Well, that's Canon L mount. We also do a version for the existing Sigma instance, uh, who we our previous turned down to the SA. So we do an S8 L mount version. That sells at 99 pounds. You can be discounted to support our existing customers. Canon fit sells at 250, uh, which is more than we have the premium product matters. I do have one little document. So I'll show you that.
Premiere Pro okay at 4K as long as I don't try to do anything to, if I'm not up at 150 meg. Well, I'm saying playback yeah. of uh, HTC voices yeah. or ATVC. Yes. DaVinci and Final Cut Pro yes. and the rest of you now. Yes, Premier, yes exactly. It's it's the the yeah. They're, 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 yeah. they're coming out as a monthly. Yeah, and I would say that if you're going down the macro, definitely go down the Final Cut route. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, you'll have to. If, you, if you're doing Apple ProRes, you'll have yeah. to do Final Cut. So there's, there's three, really three big pieces of software that oh, are in general use. Having said that, yeah. uh, on the PC, yeah. any of does support oh, yeah. ProRes Raw. Yes, so uh, Adobe, yeah. Adobe, Adobe, Adobe Premiere, yeah. Yeah. Apple Final Cut Pro, <laughs> which is for the Mac. So, but the no. no. three most common no. used no. in the mid, in the, no. and the mid to upper market. Yeah. Yeah. Above that, you're into, no, it's into um, <laughs> a whole other. Um, that one. <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Whereas on the stills, that I've ended up getting that next time. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, nice, I'll just speak to uh, call for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, it's actually called to pass four, which is amazing. Um, uh, we're running out of time because we're going to finish in a few minutes. I'm going to talk about ProRes 4. Yes. Very quickly, ProRes 4 is a variable before codec. Uh, it's actually as efficient as 42 HQ, it's incredible. Uh, it, is, it is a compression wall codec, um, but because it is variable, we don't know if it's going to be 12 bit or 10 bit or whatever yet, we don't know. Yeah, it's um, um, But um, it will be, uh, I've been using it on the EVA 1, 5.7k, 5, 5. on the EVA 1 for SDI, 6G, and it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, so, RAW is an up and coming yeah, format for Vimeo. Um, it's in the high end of video a lot, uh, but it takes a massive amount of. Processing and storage. This is EVA1 mixed with S4H and a free drone or whatever. Uh, it's shot in, some of this was shot in ProRes War on the EVA1. And I was going to show you, uh, this is online, this is some, uh, I'm working with a couple more Faustus. We've got some daily, we'll get a quick bit of a lot. So there's the S1H in time. But we can pull back the highlights. This is shot midday, by the way. Blue sky, bright sun. Um, and then you have to show you what I mean by bringing back the highlights. There's on an LED timeline video. This is what we're saying. This is Final Cut Pro. Shoot. Which is home with that program. Well, we'll see how bad that background is. I'm moving this along here. I'm just trying to show you. Can you see that highlight recovery? Temperature recovery. Light recovery. Yeah. 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 Bring it back in, details all there. I've got really dim questions. Sorry. I get waveforms. I get waveforms. The one above. Vectorscope. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm asking you what's going to be an enormous question. Simple what answer. So, do I need, if, for it to be neutral, is it just in the middle? Uh, pretty much so, yeah. Okay. Uh, what, that line. Yeah. 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 You always push your colouring around to the skin tone. You literally hit that one just above it. That's how skin tones are affected. Okay. You're going to use vectorscope. You don't want to be any out to this in squares. Yeah. Uh, the RGB and the secondary colours don't go outside of those as you're blowing out the colour. You, you, you find a spectroscope. So the colours are going all over the place. Yes, we so have we the have scope on GH5S and on um, S1H again, but I have no idea how to use it. Without the progress uh, of the final code, you've got uh, full use of the uh, control of the you know, luminance, um, you know, the shadow highlight, the mid tones, uh, and the dark control, which you can see in the Vinci, uh, they all do it their own way. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, really easy. Stick on a lot, camera a lot. Pass on the vlog at the end here. I think I've got one of the lots of mine, which going on to the end. 
Is this video also available online, or is this one of your training videos? Basically, what I can send you this now if you want. Yeah, no, no, don't send it to me. That's a grab of, um, that's me just picking one of my over 100 vlog guns I've done. Uh, dropping it in, and you can see it goes in yeah. overlaid on RAW. So Apple Pro Res RAW, yeah, it, it comes in as vlog in Final Cut Pro. You drop a lot on it, and then you can pull back the height, you can pull back the temperature, and obviously you can shadows and highlights, you can do what you need to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not good like that one for this particular scene, but it's just showing you and demonstrating um, how easy it is to get around Final Cut Pro with Apple Pro as well. And that's why it's really easy. Very quick to fast settings to get into the slow modes, the HFRs, the VFRs, and all these different animals if you want them. It's on your website now. Uh, the old the S1 set is the S1 set I'm yeah. nearly finished. The S1 set is free to yeah. download on my site. Um, I'm gonna go through, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. Remember you have angles in the S1H, so the 180 degree shutter, no matter what frame you break and pull it at, it'll always double it. So you don't have to worry about seconds, like in the photo photography, you can the shutter, yeah, it's the same as 180 if you're shooting at 24p or 25p. Yeah. We have angles on here, like pro cameras, do all decibels and all decibel, video cameras, but 180 degree rule means that motion blur between two adjacent frames is the correct yeah. inner vision motion blur, yeah? So show them what happens. If you don't get it right, so imagine a really high, fast shutter speed, it's trapped in there, have to it. This is really in video to us. This should be falling down to the ground. That did, and then it was straight. I'm like, oh my god, it straightens up on that. Oh, so they're flexible. And then, and then worked out actually it was nothing to do with just literally folding shutter. Mm. Yeah, I think we probably should have covered. I wasn't talking about what we've got, different yeah. blocks, like think. long block ones like that on the right. That's all intra, all intra when you're recording internally, 400 megabits per second. <laughs> Shot bit way, literally, memory out of the picture, and every picture is in a group, dot, group of pictures, dot, that's what it means. A group of pictures of one, one dot. In long dot, this is what's going on. One intro frame, high quality intro frame first, and the predicted frames, blue ones, in between. And if those predicted frames work out what's changed from one intro frame to the next, and then compresses it down, that difference. Saving on memory space, um, but obviously arithmetically, arith 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 if you can say it, um, it has to do a lot of processing. So that's why it takes longer on your computer to adjust or edit non dot over what you think it should be harder, it's bigger memory, and intra is all a dot of one. Uh, every frame is compressed intra into itself, into the, the, the whole frame rather yeah. than and, a and whole frame. And then are still pretty much the only cameras in the DSLM style, this style of camera market that can handle all intra. Um, and uh, again, because we work very, very hard on the, on the cooling, uh, because it's phenomenally hard on the camera, but much easier on the edit. So S1H and Netflix as well, 422, 10 bit. So we're doing for every four pixels, top two. In the bottom to a sample, so a good all round sample quality. If it's 4 to 0, like the Sony's of this world or whatever, um, some of the lesser cameras, only at the 4 pixel choice, only the top to a sample, this is just a representation of the top. 4 4 4 every pixel to a sample, and you're seeing much more use of bandwidth of memory, uh, an amazing uh, secondary for raw, but obviously very expensive on like SD cards or any SSD cards. Uh, so that's what's happening on what we're talking about 422 and the 10 bit versus 8 bit factor. 8 bit you've got 256 tones per the RGB, which are the primary colours of video, not the primary colours of art or whatever, but um, uh, which is CMYK. Uh, the RGB, um, they all produce a different colour than they're mixed. 256 tones of red, green, and blue. Multiply them, gives you 60 million colours. Not bad but way below the human eye. You get above the human eye in 4 2 10 bit. 
10 bit for every bit doubles, 8 bit, 6, yeah? 9 bit would be 512. Double it again, 512 double is 1024 for 10 bit. 10 bit, 10, uh, so one, 10 bit means 1024 tones per color. Multiply it over a billion tones. The human eye sees 1.04 billion, something like that, isn't it? Um, uh, color tonal range. So, Above it, 4 2 10 bit is absolutely minimum to work with the broadcast cinema and Netflix. Um, we qualify on every level, other cameras don't. Um, so that's the absolute minimum. 